Hello everybody, I want to start my presentation by showing you a picture of Andrea Bocelli having his Easter Day concert singing Amazing Grace in an empty Piazza del Duomo in Milan. And I hope this gives you the feeling of the lockdown in Italy. Today is the 8th of May and whatever I say now might become obsolete by tomorrow morning. It was just 13 months ago that we were all together in Venice and I had my speech about the strategic importance for the global fashion industry of Italian textiles. And here I am today, trying to reach you through my computer in my house where I've been in quarantine for two months. The good news is that gradually since last Monday's lockdown measures are being slowly released and some activities, including textiles, have reopened. The figures I've reported to you last year represents Italy's largest exporting industry. In 2019, the Italian fashion industry had a turnover exceeding 110 billion US dollars, which is roughly 5% of our national GDP. Textiles and apparel alone accounted for 60% of it, involved 50,000 different companies and employed directly half a million people. Our wool industry is a fully vertical integrated supply chain and last year imported almost 80 million kilos in between greasy wool, wool tops, yarns and fabric for a total value exceeding a billion US dollars and 95% of it has been re-exported. At the end of my speech though, I warned that the wool market values at the time were simply supply driven and that demand was poor. Weavers and spinners had announced lower orders in the range between 10 and 30% compared to the previous season. As a consequence, despite the great performance of the strongest fashion conglomerates, the scarcity of its supply, the terrible bushfires in Australia and all our efforts in introducing wool into casual wear, our products have not been easy to sell. The reason is mainly related to the very weak demand for classic menswear and the difficulty in compensating the volume lost in suiting with new products. In other words, despite all of our efforts, we must be very honest in saying that we have failed in promoting wool as a more sophisticated alternative to cotton and to synthetic materials. One reason might be its relatively high price. The second is that we haven't been able to tell our beautiful story well enough to an ever-changing customer. 15 years ago, I was working for an important fashion brand. And at the time, their cheapest Merino sweater costed $450, which I already considered to be extreme as I was aware of the price of the raw material. Well, today, their cheapest sweater, the cheapest wool sweater, cost $1,000, which means that they managed to increase their prices three times faster than the inflation rate. This happened despite the fact that the margins of their Italian suppliers become so low that over 50% of knitters and weavers in Prato went out of business. On the other hand, retailers are also struggling. Sales for multi-brand department stores are constantly declining and most of them were already in financial distress before the pandemic. On the other hand, online retailers are not doing much better and most of them are still operating at a loss. Fashion is a broken system. It is extremely inefficient and it destroys everything it touches, from its suppliers to its customers, including as we finally understand the environment. And now it is time to fix it. Today we're dealing with the biggest crisis since World War II. It is affecting our daily lives and making us very anxious about the future. But even before coronavirus, industry leaders were not optimistic about 2020. And today the same executives are working on contingency planning and crisis management. During the rest of the year, retailers will be forced to heavily discount and clear the stocks and brands will have to find new ways to regain value and convince their customers to walk back into the stores. 
The world of bargain shopping, where each garment sold is worn just a few times before ending up in the landfills, will be the one facing the biggest challenges. Being an entrepreneur, I tend to be over-optimistic, but as Winston Churchill said, you should never let a good crisis to go to waste. Out of every crisis comes a new opportunity. And this new normal is giving our industry a new chance to reset the system which for us is no longer working and to refocus on our value chain. This emergency came with a profound anthropological shock because we have decided to place human being in the foreground, putting aside the economy, the consumers and the financial institutions. We have stopped half of the planet, we have sacrificed economies and limited personal freedoms in order to save some lives. And this has never happened before in the human history. In just a couple of weeks, the human being and the environment became our priorities and we've taken measures to contain the pandemic that we thought were impossible. This new humanistic approach will also involve stronger commitment to climate change, which seems so far away when it affected only Africa and uh, the Arctic and the Pacific, but now it has somehow reached us and woke us up. We finally understood that pollution, economic crisis and viruses have no boundaries. We've understood how vulnerable we are. We've rediscovered the fear of death, the fear of suffocating. And as a consequence, I'm sure that we'll be paying more attention to the quality of the air we breathe. Remember that fashion is a consumer driven industry and now it has to reconsider its role in society because their customers are becoming more aware of the side effects on our planets of their compulsive shopping habits. Sustainability will be employed as a way to regain consumers trust and companies will introduce new tools and strategies to future proof their business models. The main focus for every industry, including ours, will be decarbonization and circularity. And while the wool industry is very strong on circularity, we all know that our products are both recyclable and biodegradable, decarbonization might become a bigger challenge than animal welfare. Our sheep produce methane, and methane has a global warming potential 104 times higher than CO2, although it is less persistent in the atmosphere. And this is what we have to fix. Many of us know that recently the shoe company All Birds has been the very first fashion brand to label its carbon footprint like calories. But they're not the only ones taking action. The Science Based Target Initiative is a project that involved in just a few months almost 900 of the largest companies in the world. Their aim is to set some goals which will become standard business practices, allowing the most sustainable corporation to play a major role in driving down the global greenhouse gas emissions. And now we should get to work, think about our industry and how this new situation will affect our businesses if we manage to navigate through the storm. I've prepared a chart which shows all the steps that a meter of cloth or a kilo of yarn must go through before being sold to the final customer. Every year starts with seasonal sales. At the beginning of winter, you can find the designers, sweaters and coats at heavily discounted prices because shops have to make room for the spring summer collection, which is delivered in January. In the meantime, the fashion shows are revealing us what we will be wearing the next season, making obsolete everything we've just bought. And the same madness happens every six months for the simple reason that the desire to purchase must be satisfied immediately. The hectic system I've described has never been our world. In this environment, we could never compete. The world of wool is much slower and our industry follows the rhythm of nature. Well, we've all been confined at home for quite a while. And I think that very few of us felt the urge of shopping for clothes. This is a problem for all of us, but it is a bigger problem for the many retailers who have been depending on compulsive shoppers for a long time. Think about fast fashion chains that rely on regular visits 
up to an average of 40 times a year to sustain their local revenues. Recently in Italy and in France, many companies have converted their factories to the production of medical devices and fashion brands are now producing face masks, medical clothes, hand sanitizers for our doctors. This shows commitment to our people and to our country, but also proves their clients, their commitment to social issues. As Warren Buffett says, it takes 20 years to build the reputations and only five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. And brands are extremely aware of this. Just two weeks ago, some big retailers announced that they wouldn't be paying their landlords in Germany when their stores were closed. And within two days, they were forced by their own customers to apologize and to pay. In an open letter published by one of them through their corporate website, they declared that they've made a mistake and lost a lot of trust. By the way, unfortunately, we're not in the same room. Otherwise, I would ask all of you to raise your hand if you've thought about wool face masks. We know wool is antibacterial. It's easy to wash, breathable, comfortable. A wool face mask will be beautiful, reusable, recyclable, but most important, biodegradable. And hopefully, some one of us will manage to make this item a success and consume a lot of wool. As I said before, retailers are now offering spring-summer collection. These garments are the ones that will be heavily discounted and wool is mainly used in winter collections. Therefore, the lockdown should not theoretically affect very much our industry. However, the market collapsed, our customers cancel orders and many contracts have been rediscussed. This is because the increase of unemployment rate and consumer uncertainty suggests that the recovery is still far away and that demand for clothes will stay low for a long time. In this environment, the future of the wool industry depends on our ability to increase our market share, which has never been this low. This is something that we keep saying and we've never managed to do. Well, back in 2000, we represented 2.5% of all textile fibers used. Today, we're well below 1%. We're actually 0.89. To reverse this trend, we must learn to get together, as we're virtually doing now, and cooperate, as each one of us individually is too small to drive any change. We must emerge as a sustainable, traceable, open and cooperative industry and solve issues like animal welfare, sustainability and decarbonization. And we must be quick, efficient and deliver what our customers are looking for before someone else does. If we fail to do so, we will remain a bunch of commodity producers, manufacturers, merchants and traders. And I refuse to accept that. We must be the change we wish to see in the world, in our world. And now let me tell you a short story. Actually, after two months at home with the twins, they're three years old, I became a master in storytelling. Mr. Einstein said his assistant, this exam which you just gave, isn't that exactly the same exam you gave to the same students a year ago? Yeah, yeah, said Mr. Einstein, it is exactly the same. But this year, the answers are different. Well, this little story introduced my next topic, which is the need for a drastic change in our mentalities. The wool business is a very traditional industry. Actually, I can't think of any other industry that has changed so little over the last 100 years. We keep buying through open cry auctions. We pay, we pack, we ship, we wash, we come, we spin, we weave, we dye, we finish, we knit, we, 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 we make the garment. And even if we might have learned to do that better, faster, cheaper, you will agree with me that our industry didn't change much since my father started working in the 70s. So how can we imagine to do better and finally increase our market share of wool and clothing? Well, luckily, the world is turning again to us because it's looking for a more durable, sustainable and authentic product. But to achieve this goal, we must stop fighting against each other and we must realize that our competitors are not the other wool producer, but our competitors are man-made fibers. 
So far we've been told to ignore animal welfare organization. But clearly the strategy has not worked. Despite what we've done, and we have done a lot, we're still under the spotlight. Meanwhile, 160 million tons of microplastics, 35% of which comes from the synthetic textiles fibers, are polluting our oceans and killing millions of animals. I understand that my latest stance might sound like a bit like a provocation to most of you, especially to the wool bodies. But remember, if you're not sitting at the table, you're probably part of the menu. And if we want to pass this concept that wool is more ethical from an animal welfare point of view than synthetic fiber, we must work together and team up with other industries like cotton and cashmere and sit down with animal welfare organization and open their eyes. If we manage to do so, if we manage to shift our mentality to this, we will be able to pass the latest test from Mr. Einstein by giving a new answer to the same question. The pandemic clearly demonstrates that we cannot take advantage of globalization without taking global risks and responsibilities. Recently, in an interview with the Financial Times, French President Emmanuel Macron said that the coronavirus pandemic will humanize capitalism forcing us to make greater efforts to save the planet from global warming and strengthening the European economic independency by investing at home in industrial sectors in which we have become over-dependent on imports. This concept was already a pillar of Trump's presidential campaign, Americans First, and became more evident last year when the debate about the transition to the 5G technology fueled the trade war between China and the US. And now this situation is also affecting textiles because one of face masks, which usually cost 20 to 30 cents, becomes rare and you can't ensure the health and safety of your medical staff. Governments understand that outsourcing the production of strategic goods simply because it's cheaper to produce them elsewhere is something that has to be reversed. And once supply chains have been disrupted, Companies start looking for alternative suppliers at home, even if they're more expensive. And if they find some, they might stick to them to mitigate this new risk. So we have to rethink globalization. Fashion brands must learn from this global trade disruption that the value chain must be reinvented. They must strengthen their regional supply chain and eventually integrate with some of their strategic supplier and customers. Of course, I'm not saying that we want to bring back wool production from Australia to Spain, but some processing, including spinning and dyeing, could potentially take advantage of this new philosophy. And I believe this will offer a new opportunity for the Italian and the European textile industries. I apologize, but I'm starting to feel a bit tired. It's a lot of talking in a foreign language and I have time constraint and a lot of things to say. I hope I can still be clear and most of you can understand me. Um, There is still a couple of things I want to discuss with you. One is the customer and especially its discounted mindset. 56% of the consumer interviewed by a leading consulting firm said that special promotion were an important factor when shopping for clothes in March 2020. To reach these disillusioned customers, brands must quickly find inventive ways to regain values. This is something I already said at the beginning of my presentation. As I also said before, the pandemic might declare the end of the extreme consumerism because many people will start rejecting the idea of buying goods in large volumes because they are aware of the environmental impact. According to the same survey, 15% of the consumer in the US and Europe expect to buy more ecologically and socially sustainable clothing. Fast fashion brands, who rely very much on cheap labor, had already to prove their social commitment, offering support to garment workers in Bangladesh after being criticized by their customers for canceling orders with their local suppliers. Consumers of luxury goods will return more quickly to pay full price for quality, timeless goods, as it has already happened, 
after the 2008 and 2001 financial crisis. They'll mainly be buying the so-called investment pieces, which are minimalist quality items that tend to last longer. The lockdown also pushed 30% of European consumers to shop online for the first time. And therefore, brands should take this opportunity to become digital front runners, offering tailored online services. Despite what we read on the press, Chinese consumers are thinking twice about their post-coronavirus spending and revenge shopping isn't really happening. Regardless, it is still extremely important to win over this Chinese middle class of brand conscious consumer. But the focus will be on meeting them locally and not abroad because we will all be traveling much less. In the meantime, high street shops in the rest of the world will have to regain their local customers. And uh, I am convinced that when we are on vacation, we tend to buy more informal clothes, while when we are at home, we buy what we need and what we wear more often. So my hope is that these shops will sell a little less tracksuits and sneakers and some more sweaters and jackets. And the last thought that I want to share with you comes from a customer of mine who pointed out how in 2001 and 2008, after the crisis, customer returned shopping for more formal clothes because they want to look more sober. They want to avoid to buy those flashy garments that have been the best-selling items in the past, I don't know, three, four, five, six years. Actually, I'm not sure if this image can be considered offensive for some of you. And if it is, please apologize. But I live in Italy and we're not famous for the respect on our institutions. But I find it quite powerful to introduce the concept of secondhand shopping. According to the World Economic Forum, the market value of secondhand clothing in the US only had reached $25 billion two years ago and is expected to get double in the middle of this decade, surpassing the sales of fast fashion. As we are moving to bigger cities and smaller apartment, we must be tidier. So if we want to buy new clothes, we must make room by selling our old ones. But the reasons for the boom of secondhand clothing are many and various. Number one is that most secondhand consumers simply find vintage clothes more interesting. There is a wide choice and allows you to be more creative. Number two, fashion is considered to be the second largest polluting industry in the world and two-thirds of the clothes end up in the landfills. But of course, second-hand market is reducing the pressure on our planet. And number three, used clothes are cheaper and uh, allow designer pieces to fit into the budget of almost everybody. So would you consider second-hand shopping to be a threat to our industry or not? To my very humble opinion, it would be a big threat if we were a volume-driven business, but we are a niche. And according to the global wardrobe study, which has been conducted by the Walmart company, wool garments are amongst the longest kept in the wardrobe. They are washed less frequently and tend to leave through the resale and change of ownership. So if you consider the price of a product as the difference between the, your purchasing price and the reselling price, wool could become much more affordable than any other fiber. And let me finish with a letter from a good friend of the wool industry. After being one of the very first one leaders to recognize the danger of this disease, showing his new collections behind closed doors during Milan Fashion Week, he recently wrote an open letter that strongly criticized today's fashion system. The letter is on the side of the slide for you to read and begins by saying that the decline began when luxury pursued fast fashion. The letter continues on stating that the enforced slowdown has brought to light the need for new values. The pause is giving the world a chance to renew the pace of proposing ideas, the focusing on production cycles and working in harmony with the season, allowing to a more livable and therefore quality driven fashion. He said that his summer collection will remain in boutique at least until the beginning of September, as it is natural and he will do so from now on. 
Through this bold statement, Mr. Armani reinforces his invitation to focus on slow-paced, high-quality products, adding on to the message of focusing on authenticity to regain a human dimension. This is what I consider slow fashion. This is the world of wool. This is a world where we can compete. It is a message of hope for all of us. And this is the end of my presentation, which I hope was interesting enough. I want to thank all of you for your attention. I want to thank IWTO for giving me again the opportunity to share my thoughts with all of you. I really hope we'll soon be able to meet each other again in person. But in the meantime, stay home, be safe, stay positive. Better times will come soon. And remember, we must be the change we want to see in our world. We are not competitors. We are friends, we are colleagues, and we are all working in the same direction, making wool again the queen of natural fibers. Thank you.